everyone. Welcome to the Dr. Quack Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Quack. And I'm the important one, Mr. Mayhem. We are now getting the F out. We are no longer in WWF Survivor Series. It's now WWE Survivor Series. Because that started in May of 2002. We're here in November 2002 with this. Yes, we are. And I enjoyed this pay-per-view, I'll tell you. I mean... The era of the F when WCW was gone, ECW was gone, and now we had to switch it over because of the World Wildlife Fund. And I, I enjoyed this show. Uh, it was it was good. There were a couple things that just made me go, what? Well, really? There's always something. But this also is the second Survivor Series. The first one we didn't bother to record because it's so bad. Thank you for that, by the way. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, there's not a single Survivor Series match on this Survivor Series show. Yeah, and that's amazing here. So let's get down to it here. It was taking place at Madison Square Garden. Where else would it be with the World Wrestling Federation? Oh, I'm sorry, World Wrestling Entertainment. Yeah, because they got the F out. Uh, it was appropriate venue. Um, I, I, I liked it, even though the, the set design made it look like it was smaller than it normally is because they had that really short rampway. Normally, Madison Square Garden has a longer rampway. So I don't know if that was because of lack of ticket sales or what, but it, it looked different, but it was still, the crowd was very hot. Definitely. And on commentary, we had Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler representing Raw. Good. And on SmackDown, we had Michael Cole and Taz. Not so good. And on Spanish commentary, we had Carlos Cabrera and Hugo Sadovich. Double great. Yes. So we're two for three on the commentary teams. I'm glad somebody was good. Taz, you suck. Ring announcer, Howard Finkel. He's great. And backstage, we had somebody who learned to be really good and somebody who was only there because she was plastic. We had the coach and Terry Runnels. Yes. Yes. And that, I enjoy Terry Runnels because she does a great job. I mean, she's underrated as an interviewer, I think. She does. She asks the right questions. Fair, but I wonder how long she had to read that script of nine words or ten words before she went out there to cut her, <laughs> cut her spot. I because do. she looked as wooden as she was plastic. Oh, wow. Okay, moving on here. <laughs> Referees, we had Tony Chimmel. Charles Robinson, Nick Patrick, Earl Hepner, Mike Kyoto, Jim Corderas, Brian Hepner, Jack Doan, Mike Sparks, Chad Patton, and anybody else you want to throw in? Well, Tony K Tony Chimmel was the SmackDown ring announcer. He wasn't a referee. Well, that's what it's saying. It's saying he was also a referee in this match. He was not. He, he was not. not. Appear. Um, they did a good job here. Raw wore the traditional black and white zebra shirts, and SmackDown wore the blue shirts. So you could definitely tell them apart. And they're all good referees. They're all competent. Nobody had any really big screw-ups. Although, I will talk about the one match that Brian Hebner did. It wasn't his fault, but there was a lot of confusion. Yeah. Now moving along here, the first match of the evening. The Dudley Boys, Bubba Ray and Spike, with Jeff Hardy taking on three-minute war warning here. Rosie, Jamal, and Rico. Yeah, so the, the storyline here is that Devon had gone to SmackDown. This was a Raw match. So they had to bring in somebody they trusted to battle three-minute warning. So the Bubba's brought in Jeff Hardy. Matt Hardy was also on SmackDown. So they had split up the Dudleys and the Hardys. And we got three-minute warning, Rosie, Jamal, and Rico. Now, Rico was the fashion designer when it was Chuck and Billy... Uh, he was really talented, but he ended up getting fired from WWF because he lied about his age. He was actually like 39 years old at this time, and he'd only been in the business a few years. He was a former Las Vegas police officer. And Rosie and Jamal are known better under other names than Three Minute Warning. Rosie was the superhero in training, and Jamal was Umaga. So all in all, I mean, this match was solid. Uh, the elimination tables actually all looked good. It was a decent match, a decent opener. Um, I went two and three quarters on it. It was nice to see this match. Uh, it was punctuated very well. Uh, Spike was eliminated first, then Rosie, then Jeff Hardy, then Jamal, and last, Rico was eliminated, leaving Spike Dudley the sole winner. 
My favorite part of this match was seeing Devon and Bubba because they got split. One went to Raw, one went to SmackDown. It upset me when I saw this live. It kind of still upset me now. But it was nice to see them back to deliver a 3D on Rico. And come January of 2003, they were merged back together again. They realized they made a mistake. Yes, they did. I gave this match two and three quarter stars. I thought that this was a great opener. Uh, it definitely popped the crowd. They definitely enjoyed it. They definitely did. This was one of the most dangerous eras in wrestling, the end of the Attitude Era, the beginning of Ruthless Aggression, because there were more neck surgeries during this time, back and shoulder surgeries, because people were taking a lot of wild and crazy bumps because of crowds chanting, we want tables. Well, at least they were entertained. And now we got our next match here. We got Before we go into the next match, we had to go to WWF New York. Now, that was right down the street, or WWF World. They didn't even call it New York anymore. It was yeah. WWF World. God. And we had Stacey Keebler, who, as I've said many times, is a gorgeous woman, but has absolutely no talent whatsoever. She should not be allowed anywhere in front of a camera. And, and of course, she had to put over that she was happy that Tess was going to be surrounded by testicles. Testicles! Now let's move on, because I just wanted to point that out, that, that Stacey Keebler got to say testicles on television, and no one cared. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we had Billy Kidman taking on Jamie Noble with Nidia for the Cruiserweight title. Yeah, Nidia was a short blip on the radar, and it's not fair. She was actually pretty good. She was. She was talented. The, the problem was she got the bad stigma of winning the second uh, Tough Enough contest, and she wasn't a, the most friendly of people, but she was very talented. So she was a short blip on the radar, and this was kind of punishing her by putting her with Jamie Noble against Billy Kidman for the Cruiserweight Championship. This was typical WCW-style Cruiserweight matches of lots of action, lots of spots, and not a lot of selling. But it was still good. I went two and a half stars on it. It was decent. Um, and this is what the first title change of the night. We're going to keep a running count here. Yeah, I mean, I went two and a quarter. It was a good, you know, passing of the... Setting the table for the um, show here, but you know it, it wasn't spectacular. It was just like okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, Nidia took a nice bump. I'll give her that. She yeah. took a nice bump for that. But yeah, two yeah. and a half. Yeah, it was basically or two and a quarter. It was basically a typical cruiserweight match of the er of the late nineties, early two thousands. You threw everything at the wall, and that's part of why the crowd kind of lost interest in a while for a while in the cruiserweight matches because when you've thrown everything you have and you have nothing left to throw. Nobody cares what you've got left. Pretty much. I mean, moving along here, and this was one of my, before I get to this match, there was a scene here where you had a camera up in the uh, ceiling pointing down at Victoria because she was looking in the mirror going, mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the most beautiful of them all? And the mirror said Trish Stratus in her head. And she went crazy. She broke the mirror and she broke the cardboard of Trish Stratus. And then we go into this match here. Hardcore match for the Women's Championship. Victoria taking on Trish Stratus. I don't know what it is about Trish Stratus. When you're a walking, talking 11, uh, women seem to go nuts. Uh, she had problems with Don Marie. She had problems with Victoria. Problems with Mickey Mickey James, all these women that went crazy. They continually wrote the crazy storyline for women facing the ultimate 11. And, and this one, at least Victoria is the most talented of all the ones they put in there. And yes, I'm going to say she's more talented than Mickey James. Okay. But and that's a close battle, but close. it's an argument, arguable battle. But I'm saying Victoria was more talented. Okay. And this match, as he said, um, Women in hardcore gimmicky type matches, they don't normally work out. This one was better than most, but it still wasn't great. It, it put over the story. It was I went two stars. It wasn't bad. It just it was okay. Well, I went just the opposite on this. I thought this was probably the best hardcore match I had seen. You know, I'm going three and a half as far as females doing hardcore. That's rare. And that's why I'm kind of giving them the higher bump on this. I enjoyed the fact they broke out everything from the fire extinguisher to the ironing board to the kendo sticks to everything else. There was a lot of, there was a lot of problems. Like the, the fire extinguisher, you saw that it come up and then Victoria realized she hadn't pulled the pin. And that hurt it. It hurt the flow bit. of that. 
the extra effort it took to set up the ironing boards, that's those all things hurt the way I saw this match of it still didn't feel organic. Like, yes, as far as the what they did in there and actually laying into each other, yes. I, I would agree with you three and a half stars. Because they lay full force. They, they didn't was, love tapping each other. But there was a lot of... You didn't see any leg slaps. Correct. But there was a lot of hiccups in, in the storytelling that went on there. That's why I was only okay. Okay, well, there you go. Difference of opinion on that. Now we're moving on to the WWE Championship Big Show against Brock Lesnar. And my favorite part of this, I just got to tell you, what was the backstage with Paul Heyman, you know, talking to Brock Lesnar about, don't worry, I'm going to leave with my client at, with, the, with the WWE Championship. Even as a fan, I saw where this was going. Yeah. Now, now, going back really quick, Victoria won. That means we have two title matches with two title changes. Yeah. So, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Paul Heyman is a master yeah. of telling you what you think you hear and not what you actually are going to hear. He's He would be the type of person that would tell you you're going to get a haircut if you lose the match and then cut one hair. <laughs> because that was a hair cut. Paul Heyman is a master of this. He is. And, well, I enjoyed that a lot, and I enjoyed the storytelling with Paul Heyman. This match kind of sucked. It was really short. It was really poorly thrown together. It was the camera angles in this were wrong. Now, I to say it sucked, I did give it two and a quarter stars, but watching this in 2002, it's obvious they've always booked Brock Lesnar as a five-minute man. I don't think Big Show was the right person for this. The really the story between the two of them fell flat. When Paul Heyman, when the manager's story and the manager's promo interests me more than the match, you get two and a quarter stars. See, I went three stars on this. And the reason why is because the ending I thought was great. I mean, because they set it up where Brock Lesnar hit him with the F5 and they thought he was going to win. The referee got bumped, of course. And then here comes Brian Hapner. Here, let me run by. Hey, Paul Heyman, hold on. One, two. Oh, let me pull my leg out. Yeah, well, that was Jimmy Corderas, but I know what you're saying. Yeah, Corderas, I'm sorry. I look like Brian Hapner. I couldn't remember. No, Hapner had the next match. Oh, that's right. He had the next match. But, yes, I mean, I, I enjoyed the finish on it. I thought it was fine. I loved how he chokeslammed him square on a, on a steel chair. That looked legit. That's why I went three stars. I thought this was actually a really good match. And, and the only thing that sucked was Paul Heyman went with Big Show. Not for long. Not for long. And they realized, again, you don't take away great things. Bob Ray Devon. Three for three now on title changes. Three for three now on title changes. And now I'm going into my fire attack. Because this match here was probably the best match uh, on the card, and I'm going to tell you why. Los Guerreros, Eddie Guerrero, Chavo Guerrero taking on Edge and Rey Mysterio taking on Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit. What you got to see originally back a little while before uh, this match happened was Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit arguing. And, you know, partners don't shake hands. They hug. Yeah, I love that line. And, and you know, the match itself, I mean, because what happened was Paul Heyman went to Triple H and said, look, can I have these six guys on SmackDown? And they all laughed at him. They all laughed at Paul Heyman and said, there's no way you're going to make SmackDown better than Raw. And those six guys, through interchangeable matches, including this one, really set the table for where SmackDown is today. I mean, it really brought it up to that level where people wanted to watch during this time frame. I gave this match three and a half stars. I thought this was probably the match of the night. I definitely enjoyed it, and, you know, anything with Ben Juan Angle is always great to me. It's always great, and um, I, I do have to give a You Smell em Award moment during this match, but it's not for this match. Opening this match was the 2002 WrestleCrap.com Gooker Award winner, Al Wilson. <sighs> Seeing Al Wilson and Don Marie before we started this match, I was about ready to turn this off. I'm glad I didn't. I actually went higher on this one. This one I went three and three quarters. Holy hell. So, editor, make sure you're paying attention. I know there's tons of pictures of this. I want to spray Al Wilson right in his face. You got? Good. You stunk up wrestling for a long time. I'm sorry you passed away, but you didn't belong in wrestling. 
Now, this great match here. This was a tag team elimination style. And what they did is the Guerrero story was they didn't want to be involved. They kept jumping away and not getting tagged into the match, which was great storytelling. They had the, pro the, the problem going on with uh, Benoit and Angle. Started out working together until there was a, another miscommunication. Um, Edge and Rey Mysterio came in the champions. They left without the champions, so we're now four for four. But the one problem here, Brian Hebner was the referee, and partway through, he kept trying to put Kurt Angle out of the ring. Well, the, the commentary team of Michael Cole and Curly didn't do a good job of explaining that there was a tag or not a tag somewhere. So it looked really odd when you watched it that it kept trying to put Kurt Angle out, even though Kurt Angle was the one that they were ultimately working on the most. So there was a lot of confusion in there, but... Chris Benoit was first eliminated, eliminating that team, but they came in and destroyed everybody, and it was awesome. And then we had Rey Mysterio get pinned, leaving Chavo and Eddie Guerrero the new tag team champions. Yeah, I, I love this match. I mean, this was one of the best matches on the card. But now we're going from the best to my two finger salutes because this, to me, I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice on this because this really just did not belong here. I get why they did it, but Chris the Whiskey really got to have him come out here like he's some sort of superstar. The guy sucked in the ring. The guy sucked everywhere he went. He's not that good, and they had to bring him out here because I guess they needed five, ten minutes to kill between that and the main event. I mean, seriously, him and Matt Hardy came with a little scuffle. I lost all interest at that point. I was like, I'm going to go get me a soda because this, this part just sucked. And it gets my two finger salute. Now, Chris Nowitzki was brought out here because he really is a Harvard graduate, which is in Boston. And this took place in New York City. Now, I was okay with Nowitzki. Yes, he wasn't great in the ring. Uh, after 12 concussions, he decided to hang it up smartly enough. Thank you, God. And he went into becoming a brain specialist. In fact... He's the one that determined that Chris Benoit, when they did an examination of his brain, had CTE or chronic or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which was a brain in injury caused by multiple concussions. So he's done a lot of great things outside the wrestling business. Now, the reason this was all done was Chris Nowitzki was on Raw, Matt Hardy was on SmackDown. They both came down to put over their heelness and to introduce Big Papa Pump. Yay. Yeah, that too. I, I was, that's why I forgot which that. Led, which led to Chris Nowitzki and Scott Steiner having debates that were even worse. Steiner math. Yes, which led to uh, Triple H and Big Papa Pump's match that was so bad you could see Triple H getting frustrated trying to drag 30 minutes out of Big Papa Pump when he's blown up at five. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, the two-finger salute is ultimately deserved, but I think you gave it to the wrong guy. You should have gave it to Scott Steiner because he didn't belong <laughs> that in That whole segment is getting my two-finger salute. So let's move on from there. And now we get to move on to the main <sighs> events. And this was a first here for professional wrestling, the Elimination Chamber. Shawn Michaels, Triple H, with Ric Flair, Chris Jericho, Kane, Booker T, and Rob Van Dam. And I would tell you why I love this Elimination Chamber match versus others. Because you didn't have padding on the ground. You didn't have padding on top of the cage. It was a legitimate, deadly force. And we got color! I will agree with you, but I will also, we both were workers. We both spent a lot of years in the ring. WWF has one of the hardest travel schedules of any wrestling group around. Sure. I understand why they put padding on there because you ha they have to perform the next day. You know, we have an Elimination Chamber pay-per-view and they have to perform the next day. Yeah, so most I of see the point of it, but you're right. It added the mystique that was needed for this match. Right. And, I mean, the guys did not perform the next day. In fact, uh, Triple H got carried out. Michaels got carried out. A lot of guys didn't perform for like a week, I believe. But, yeah, this match here, I definitely enjoyed it. I, I loved, 
you know, how Jericho and Hunter worked together to work on Michaels during points, even though they were enemies. It showed a lot of things there. RVD, you know, jumping off the top of the cage, you know, off top of the platform. That was great. You know, a lot of great things in this match, but I, I enjoyed it. I actually gave this match four stars. I went four and a quarter. Now, the order of starting, first two people to start the match were Rob Van Dam and Triple H. Then coming out of the pods was Chris Jericho, Booker T, Kane, and last, HBK. Now, Triple H earned a lot of respect and rewards because of this match. When Rob Van Dam did what he what you talked about, come off the top of the pod, he actually caught Triple H in the throat and partially crushed his larynx. He continued on. They had to change some things, but they continued on because Triple H cared more about performing and the show must go on. They took him out of a few spots and worked on it, but he gained so much respect, he was able to wipe away the curtain call and basically prove to everybody he deserves to be here. He's also... Chuck Norris approves. Exactly. He also did it when he tore a quad in the middle of a match and continued to perform. Uh, he He's done it when he had separated a shoulder and popped it back into place and continued to perform. Triple H bro, gets a lot of a hate from people, not from the important one, Mr. Mayhem. He proved he cares more about performing and putting on and putting over the boys than he does. When Kevin Nash... Tore a quad walking across the ring and laid there like a lump. It's obvious he didn't care. Yeah, I mean, it definitely did. I thought this was an excellent show. I definitely enjoyed it. But now that is the end of our I show. I was going to go over the announcements here. We, you know, oh. we have to go how we got eliminated. See, he wants to get us out of here, but I love you guys. See, I care about more about you, Kevin Nash. <laughs> oh, go ahead. So Rob Van Dam got pinned out by Booker T. Booker T got eliminated by Chris Jericho. Kane got eliminated by Chris Jericho. Jericho by HBK. And the last one out, Triple H lost HBK, making it a perfect 5-for-5 five five on title changes. HBK won the world title. Yeah, I mean, if you look at all the Survivor Series, this was definitely one you want to watch. I think it was a quality one. No, there was no Survivor Series matches, but it was a quality pay-per-view. And it, this, this match became its own pay-per-view down the road. You done now? I'm now done. Let's, let's, let, let's see how you're going to abuse me because you gave me yeah, a good one. Because that's the end of our show here. And we're going to our final Survivor Series show two years down the road. This one's not bad. Two in a row? You're going to give me two good ones in a row? Oh, but you wait for two weeks after this. Oh, yeah, two weeks afterwards. Yeah, that, this next show is going to be great. But the yeah. one after, you just wait. Oh. You're Enjoy this while you can. Thank I'm you. Dr. Quack. And I'm praying that, that the next one isn't as bad as he's making it out to be. And we're out. <laughs>